Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. We visit a hidden flower gem in Palatine County. You could plant your own salsa garden this spring, and we take a closer look at agriculture in the nation's fastest growing community, Loudoun County. Welcome back, everyone. We're coming to you from Chadwick and Sun Orchids in Palatine County. And Mother's Day is quickly approaching, and I know I love getting flowers for my day. But instead of giving her roses or violets, why not give her an orchid this year? This may look like a rainforest, but instead, this is a hidden gem in Palatine County, Chadwick and Sun Orchids Greenhouse. Inside the balmy building are literally thousands of orchids both in bloom and awaiting their colorful caps. It all started in the 40s. My father had been growing orchids since he was a child. And he grew up at a time when corsages were the orchid flower. And uh, it sort of transgressed into the pot plant industry about the 80s. And that's when we formed Chadwick and Son Orchids. So I'm the son, but he's still involved at 87. The most interesting thing about Chadwick's business is that it is truly a revolving door for customers. You see, the greenhouse is what Arthur Chadwick calls the orchid daycare. Orchids only bloom about three months out of the year. Many of his most loyal customers will bring their plants back to him to board the plants for $2 a month. The staff tends to the plants, pampering them, if you will, until it's time to bloom again. They will then contact the customer as new buds appear in about a year. It all started when we first uh, sold an orchid and someone said, well, thank you, this is lovely. Uh, when it finishes blooming now, what do I do with it? I said, well, it's really quite easy. They said, well, is there any way you could take care of it for me? I guess I could, sure. Well, now 13,000 plants later, that's what we do. Our main business is taking care of other people's orchids for $2. And they're not just sent away while they're on vacation. They, they want us to keep them until they bloom again. The greenhouse has more than 13,000 orchids. 8,000 of those are boarded plants. Chadwick and Son Orchids has the largest selection of blooming orchid plants in the area and has been a family agricultural business since 1989. Part of a farm on 18 acres of wooded land, this busy greenhouse supplies all the orchids for a small store in the fan area of Richmond. You literally have difficulty focusing while in the store because there are so many different varieties, each with a special characteristic and color. Orchids are the largest family of flowering plants with more than 25,000 documented species found on every continent. The plant's first flowers will not appear until five to seven years after germination. Many orchids sold in stores are more than a decade old. For starters, they live forever. So he has many of his original plants from the 40s, and he got them from somebody else, he got them from somebody else, so they're already over 100 years old. And orchids will live forever if taken care of, so certainly the longevity of them. The flowers are very long-lasting, several months, and come back year after year. And they're such interesting shapes and colors and styles, there's something for everyone. Orchids are popular. According to the USDA and the American Orchid Society, the orchid has surpassed poinsettias, chrysanthemums, and African violets as a favorite flowering plant for consumers. Greenhouse and nursery products are Virginia's fifth largest agricultural commodity based on cash receipts. The Chadwicks are definitely part of the state's largest industry. And they say the secret to raising a beautiful orchid in your own home is pampering the plant. General orchid care is keeping your plant damp all the time. We don't want it to get bone dry so that the leaves fall off or it falls out of its pot. And we want nice warm temperatures, 60 to 90 year round. If it gets cooler than that, sometimes it can chill them and shock them. Over, let's say 100, they get stressed out. And yet one of the secrets to growing orchids is to put them outside for the summer. 
because there you get rainforest type conditions. Hot, sticky, good air circulation. That's, think of yourself as living in the rainforest. That's what the plant wants. You can find out more about Orchid Care and Chadwick and Son Orchids at chadwickorchids.com. Virginia's green industry encompasses a wide range of operations. Virginians grow shrubs and flowers and houseplants and sod for golf courses and football fields. The combined green industry generates nearly $252 million in cash receipts for growers and operators. There are more than 21,000 Virginians employed in the green industry, doing everything from caring for the plants in greenhouses to installing shrubs in the yard and putting down fresh sod outside a new home. Each year, 15 to 20 percent of the industry is composed of spring greenhouse transplants. Even landscape architects and designers are part of the Virginia green industry. Hi, today we're going to be talking about how to grow a salsa garden from the ground up. Please stay tuned. More than 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made a promise to our local farmers to protect and preserve a way of life they'd worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member and enjoy the many benefits of membership. There's a local Farm Bureau in every county of the state. We think everyone should be a friend of the farm. Visit our website at VAFB.com to learn more. Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension has some suggestions on growing salsa ingredients in your garden from the ground up. Hi and welcome. Today we're at Randolph Farm and we're going to be talking about how to grow a salsa garden. Many of you love salsa and actually growing a garden with a lot of those components that make up salsa is fairly easy. Uh, you have tomatoes, onions, cilantro, peppers, and uh, really many of you grow those anyway, so why not just kind of work towards a salsa garden and grow those. Uh, today we're going to be talking about different ways that you can grow these and one way is to grow a, a pot, a container garden uh, with all these components. Um, what you see here, we have a, a container, a fairly large container, about 12 or 14 inches in diameter. It's filled with some type, with a potting soil that you'd get at a garden center. Not garden soil, but something a little different with different components. Uh, and this is something pretty easy to do. A pot this size, uh, you need tomatoes. We can grow tomatoes in here. We take a tomato transplant like this. We're going to make a depression in here. This one's a little tall and leggy, so we're going to, with tomatoes, you can bury them a little bit. We're going to get that down in there and cover it up nicely. Um, so with a salsa garden, something tall like tomatoes you'd want in a container like this, and you'd want to maybe put something like cilantro in this in the, on the perimeter. A little cilantro there, and you can grow that all around the sides. So when you take this out and put it on your deck or patio, this tomato is going to grow up nice and tall. You might end up putting some type of cage around this whole thing to keep it in, but you're going to have tomatoes, you're going to have cilantro, you could even put some onions, some onion sets in here. It's also nice when you're thinking about onion production is to get transplants, get the onion plants. And you can find those at certain garden centers, but to plant those directly in here, usually with those onion plants, you get a much larger uh, onion at the end. So what you've got here is you've got a few components, onions, tomatoes, cilantro, and when you think about the tomatoes that you want to grow, you see the tomatoes behind us are really nice, big, beefsteak, slicer type tomatoes, and they're very juicy. Uh, you don't want a lot of that necessarily for salsa. You don't want so much juice in your salsa, so maybe a paste or aroma type tomato might be a better variety uh, for this particular garden. So what you've got here, you've got your tomatoes again and your cilantro, um, and you could do the same thing with peppers. I don't have a pepper plant because we're not quite, quite ready for those yet this time of year, but you'd put a pepper plant right in the center, and you could also plant some more cilantro and, um, and your onions or onion plants right around here. All in all, it makes a really nice container garden, a few of these pots maybe in your, on your deck, on your patio, making sure that you get plenty, plenty of sunlight during the day. All these plants are going to require at least six to eight hours of sunlight. It'd be great to have them in full sun if you could. Now one thing you have to think about here is watering. This type of media, this potting soil, can dry out very quickly, so make sure that you check it every day. Make sure these plants aren't uh, wilting down. Make sure that you give it a good amount of water. Now one of the things you can do, because all these plants need fertilizer, 
is to add maybe some type of liquid fertilizer throughout the season. And you'll find directions when you go to your garden center and buy the liquid fertilizer, that water soluble fertilizer, you'll find the directions on how much you need to add for tomatoes and for peppers. And you can just add that in with a watering can. Now another way that you could grow this is going to be out in the garden, in the garden soil. And many of you love to grow these kind of components and you can just grow them and put them together. But you might think about growing them in one plot. Uh, you could make a raised bed garden that maybe is four feet wide and four feet long. And every square foot you could grow some of these components. You might have one row, maybe four feet across, where you have three tomato plants. And that will work pretty well for their spacing. And the next row up of the four feet, you might have four pepper plants. Usually those are much smaller than tomatoes. They don't get as tall. So remember to put those tall tomato plants on the north side of your bed. With those pepper plants, um, you could raise hot peppers, chilies like uh, habaneros, um, some of those hot peppers. Uh, you could also have bell peppers. It depends on how much heat you want in your salsa ultimately. And then in the front of that four by four uh, garden space, you could have your cilantro and onions planted. So kind of having all that together in one area kind of makes you work towards your salsa. Well, this can be a great thing for, for all of you to think about. Children would love this to, to work in containers and you, they can help you uh, grow your salsa garden throughout the year. Now, if you want to find more information about how to grow a lot of these plants together, uh, please contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. From the ground up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Chef John Maxwell has a colorful and spicy salad treat in mind coming up next in the heart of the home. Root vegetables like beets are often considered a wintertime treat. Chef Maxwell shows us that you can enjoy them all year long as pickled beets in the heart of the home. Hi, and welcome to Heart of the Home. We're here at Meadow Hall, Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia, and every week we get to play with some great Virginia food. Well, today we're going to be playing with some neat stuff. We're going to be, we're going to be pickling some beets. All right, so we've got good agricultural products, Virginia beets, uh, with a very spicy little brine. So I'm going to add into this, I'm going to add water, a couple of cups, vinegar. I'm using apple cider vinegar and sugar. I'm using about half what I got, about, about a cup and a half. Now this is going to cook until it begins to dissolve the sugar. It doesn't take very long for that to happen. Right. I'm going to add some crushed red pepper and some whole coriander, some whole peppercorns. I'm making a little modified batch here. The recipe that you'll be able to find on the Farm Bureau or on my website, chefjohnmaxwell.com, um, will have the actual ingredients for this batch there. Mm -mm -mm. We want to bring it to a boil so all the elements that are in those spices can have a chance to leach out of the seeds or, or stems that they are and flavor this brine. Add a couple of bay leaves and a sprig of rosemary. And the last spice that I need to put in here is a little bit of anise seed. Gives it that nice little licorice kind of background. And this is going to take about five or six minutes to come to a boil and get all of these flavors to blend. I've got a nice little combination of golden beets and red beets here. I get them all peeled off and down in there. I'm wearing a glove to keep my hand from getting too stained while I'm playing, especially with those red beets. All right, so nice and clean. Otherwise, it really stains badly. So I've, I've got the, the peeled beets. I'm going to add to some one inch square cuts of onion. Right. I'm going to now ladle some of this brine. It's piping hot. 
and very, very spicy. Now, spicy doesn't mean hot. Spicy means full flavored. Uh, cinnamon is a spice. Pepper is a spice too, but does, not everything that's spicy is hot. Uh, here we go. We've got these all in there. Now, I'm going to let this set for a few minutes, then I'm going to put them into cups, right? and put it into the refrigerator and let it set for 24 hours. All right, now I've got the beets. They've been marinated for about 24 hours or so. I'm going to get them into this container here. I want to save some of this brine, because this is going to be a boost to our salad dressing for our wonderful mixed green salad with beets. Now, if you want to cut these up, you can cut these up, but I'm, I'm just going to leave them whole right, and decorate them across the top. And you can see the difference in the color between the golden beets and the red beets. The golden beets have picked up a lot of the red color. They're still lighter, so they give you some contrast on your plate. And I'm going to sprinkle some blue cheese on top of this. You can use whatever salad dressing you want on this. It shouldn't be too big a flavor because it'll compete too much with the red beets uh, and, the, and the brine. Uh, I use the brine as, a, as the vinegar in my dressing for this and add a little olive oil to it. But whatever you're comfortable with is good. All right. And there we go. Uh, pickled beets. My way. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at chefjohnmaxwell.com. Whether sold to grocery chains, restaurants, or directly to the consumer, few Virginia vegetables are processed. More than 1,665 Virginia farms produce more than $92 million worth of vegetables in a given year. Making lettuce, beets, potatoes, and tomatoes and other crops the eighth largest sector of the Old Dominion's farm economy. In recent years, the local foods movement has become a large driver for more vegetable production. Many beginning farmers and part-time growers raise vegetables for sale at farmers markets through community-supported agriculture operations or at pick-your-own farms. Organically raised vegetables also offer farmers an opportunity to earn extra money for their hard work. Loudoun County has the distinction of being one of the closest rural communities to Washington, D.C. As Dave Miller reports, it also has an agricultural economy that balances the pressures of suburban growth. The beautiful rolling hills of Loudoun County were first settled in 1725 and became independent from nearby Fairfax County in 1757. For more than two centuries, agriculture was the dominant industry in Loudoun County, but beginning in the early 1960s, suburban growth changed the eastern side of the county when Dulles International Airport was built. In the last three decades, Loudoun County's population has nearly quadrupled to about 330,000 residents. Today, you'd never know parts of Loudoun County were once farmland, but agriculture is still a vital part of the community. If your intent is to, to come in new to agriculture with the idea that you'll run 120 head of cattle over 800 acres, um, there may be a few possibilities to do that here, but very, very few and, and fewer as time goes on. Uh, if your idea is to have a smaller parcel and to have a number of different animals, perhaps small ruminants, poultry, uh, and of course the, the horses, then it's an excellent location for that type of, of agriculture. Loudoun County was once a major dairy farm center, but the last dairy farm closed decades ago as the area transitioned to other agriculture. There are nearly 1,400 farms in the county covering about 134,000 acres. The average farm size is less than 100 acres, but Loudoun's producers have generated farm sales of more than $37 million annually in recent years. One advantage they have is the diversity of what can be raised in this fertile county and the abundance of residents and markets in which to sell. Hay and forage grass are the most prominent, followed by beef cattle and calves. 
Grapes, apples, and nursery products are also raised in the county, as well as poultry, horses, sheep, and goats. Locally grown foods are also an important part of Loudoun's farm economy. The demand for, for Virginia wines has led to uh, just uh, a, a large increase in the, the number of orchards and vineyards that are, that are here. There are a lot of people with um, good jobs that, you know, that have the income um, that, and they're very interested and um, somewhat uh, enlightened to the fact that they want to buy food that is raised nearby. Um, that they want to know the person who is raising their food and in hopefully more and more cases we'll see them wanting to educate their children about how food is grown and produced. A decade ago Loudoun County had the dubious distinction of being named the fastest growing community in the country. There's no question that high income and highly educated residents are changing the character of the community. But Loudoun County farmers are working to keep remaining farms profitable. We've had more and more young people come in to farming um, lately, starting up really innovative, interesting uh, CSA programs and family farm homesteads and education programs and stuff like that. I love the sheep and they, we raise them for wool, but we really don't make much money on the wool. We make blankets, very nice blankets from up in Massachusetts that are uh, put together and we sell those. But uh, we also have a little vineyard, a couple of acres, and we sell our grapes to a, a winery, and we can make a little money there. So the fact of the matter is, we need other income. And so we have two bed and breakfast cottages, and we do a wedding business. There is a demand for almost anything we can produce, um, whether it's, it's direct market meat or wool, like what's behind me, whether it's the grapes on the farm here for the wine, um, really anything that you can think of, there is a market either in Eastern Loudoun, Fairfax, Washington, D.C., and it's very close. So although our land values are incredibly expensive and our cost of doing business is very high, luckily we can also demand a pretty premium price for those premium products. Local government leaders have not been blind to the tremendous changes in their formerly agrarian community. Zoning changes in the 1990s were intended to reduce cluster growth, but as older farmers retired and the money to develop their land was so high, development kept coming. Farm Bureau leaders continue to work with their community to protect the precious farmland remaining in Loudoun County, using tools like conservation easements. We need to do more first to help younger farmers get into the business. We have to um, institute a conservation easement program that the county can help support because every easement uh, may cost $40,000 at the outset to get legal fees, surveys, appraisals, and uh, the farmers need help with that. And with every new house, it costs the county more money to provide services, schools and public services. We're still farming up here in Loudoun. Um, we're going to be here. We're not going anywhere. You know, we're teaching other farmers a little bit about how to outreach to the public and show them what you're doing and, and, and have a business that really works for, uh, for that direct market to the public and being in the public eye, too. Whether it's fresh vegetables and fruit, local meats, wine, cattle, goats, horses, or sheep, you can find it right here in Loudoun County, a farming community determined to adapt and thrive in the shadow of the nation's capital. In Loudoun County, Virginia, I'm Dave Miller. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay